As a uh, year of our Mindugi, uh, make the sense you're not a uh, right to give it power to uh, in the Malaja Ganga Kunai, um, Nurumbangu in the Malaja Ganga Kunai, Mujigangu. Um, so yeah, my name is Nathan Sennis, I'm a right to man. Um, my family is traditionally from Mudgee, New South Wales, but um, like Mary, I'd also like to acknowledge that I'm here, on, I'm actually here on Ganga Kunai country, I'm actually in the um, the Aboriginal Healing Service at um, Gunai Kunai Country in um, Gippsland, Victoria. So I'm um, actually not in my office today. Um, and what I thought I'd talk about quickly is more in trying to consider about talking about um, what information do libraries need or what information do libraries have that would support First Nations communities. Um, I'll talk about it through a couple of just quickly through a couple of brief projects that I've just recently been working on. One being the um, now completed uh, First Nations Cultural Protocols at the University of Sydney Library. Um, that I, was help, I helped guide um, as my time there as a Wingara Muru advisor, and as well as the upcoming, um, at the Australian Museum, the upcoming um, Unsettled exhibition that we're having opening in uh, late May. Um, but but uh, the reason why I want to talk about these is because these weren't specifically around, um, these were more about what to do with the information we already have and how to make it more accessible and how to, um, both these projects I um, was very, um, very focused on making sure that um, even though um, me, especially with Unsettled, even though it was me and the First Nations curator really shaping it, we wanted to make sure it was we got multiple perspectives on it, multiple First Nations perspectives. So um, looking at the First Nations protocols at uh, University of Sydney. So uh, to give you a little bit of background, uh, the University of Sydney has been doing lots of, um, library has been doing lots of great work trying to ensure that its um, collection, its services, its spaces are more um, culturally appropriate and more um, are culturally safe um, spaces. And I think this is important because um, they have, of course, many uh, Aboriginal staff, many Aboriginal students, but they also have, because of the, um, how old the University of Sydney is itself and how long, especially something like the anthropology department and the museum department, they actually have a large, they're actually a large repository of First Nations knowledge. So that they want their, so they have communities um, outside their institution that would probably want to access that information as well. So um, they, they've been doing lots of great work before they got me on board. They um, got me on board to help guide their First Nations um, cultural protocols. And one of the things I wanted to do was um, to um, make sure that I make the protocols best suited to their organization and best suited to the First Nations staff and students that are already um, either not using the facilities or are. So basically what I did was I um, just had lots of conversations with people. So I had, I did something what um, we call now the, we've called the cultural audit. But basically I, I internally at University of Sydney, I asked staff, I asked mem members of all different divisions and different levels, just basically asked them a series of questions, you know, like uh, how well do you think First Nations people are represented in the spaces and the collections? Um, how much, how comfortable do you feel about um, engaging with First Nations culture? And what's your background in it? So trying to gauge the base level of where the university library itself was at. And then I actually spoke with um, a number of First Nations um, lecturers, um, some staff in the sort of student support areas, some of the other staff working in other areas like the museum, First Nations staff working in the museum, and also talked to um, several First Nations students, including we were lucky and got to speak to about 24 um, first year um, Aboriginal bachelor students. And basically we had to, um, that conversation was basically, they did a tour of the library. And after we actually asked them, how do they feel about the library? What, uh, what's your general impressions? And with all the other um, staff, and students I spoke to, I basically just asked them, what do you think of the library? And what could the library do to better support you? Um, and so they basically shaped the protocols, but 
in not very surprising ways. Again, it wasn't about a lot of, um, especially the faculty, a lot of their um, input was not really about, um, they did want more different types, more diverse information within the collection. They would like the collection to represent the diverse points of view of um, the community of Australia. And, and, and they felt like um, historically First Nations points of view were missing from um, the university's collection. But a lot of it was actually to do with the information the university already provides. And again, um, it does have a very historic collection. And their thing was more about how do we get students to engage with that information, but in a way that is um, critical. How do we get them to critically engage with that information? Because their fear for was basically is a lot of this old information, and not even that old, like you know, from the 80s previous, is that information contains a lot of potentially uh, racist, offensive. Um, views that would be considered outdated now. Um, how do we get students to engage with this information? Because it is important that they engage with it and they understand the true history of Australia, but how do we get them to engage it and not just straight replicate that information? How do we add that critical lens to it? So that was one of the big things that um, shaped the protocols and sort of creating spaces where we could, um, you know, when and uh, lots of libraries do this now, where um, when you enter the library catalog there, is warnings and a lot of the warnings um, are based around sort of uh, deceased peoples when it comes to First Nations knowledge. But we wanted to add sort of, you know, another thing where basically, I think Trove has done this too now, where it's like basically saying that uh, these view, there are a lot of sort of um, potentially offensive and uh, outdated views within this collection um, and to be wary of that. And then, we'll, and then we're gonna try to work through our collection of figure out um, more and more what material is in that collection. Because again, um, we don't want to uh, limit people's access to it because it's important that um, people engage with it. And sometimes that same information that has offensive information also has key language information that First Nations communities would like to access to. So they, they were actually the main things that sort of shaped those protocols. Um, and to quickly uh, shift gears into the Unsettled exhibition, um, so we've got an exhibition coming out later this year and it was actually in response to the 250th anniversary of James Cook coming to the east coast of Australia. Uh, you know, places like the State Library of New South Wales, the National Museum also had responses. Um, we were kind of affected by COVID because of my large part was going to be a filming on country. So we were actually unable to um, finish the project um, by the 250th anniversary of last year. But um, before we were given this project, um, the museum did say we want it to be a completely a First Nations point of view. And they asked us what, uh, and we were initially hesitant, me and the other First Nations members of our team. And they said, what could we do to like ease your, um, your concerns? And we said, this, as long as we had complete control of the exhibition, and as long as we had six months to consult on the exhibition. So we actually got, uh, they said yes to both. So we actually had six months to consult on the exhibition of Unsettled. And what we did was we actually went out to different communities, a lot of New South Wales based communities, because that's where we have strong connections as individuals in the First Nations team. But we were able to contact people, you know, from Western Australia, um, to Australia, and we basically asked them, um, what do you think of the Australian Museum? What do you think of James Cook? Um, to consider an exhibition um, talking about the events of 1770, what do you want to see and what don't you want to see? And those four questions actually have completely shaped the exhibition because we, we know that this is a, um, a contentious story and we know that we also don't want to, even though we're individual First Nations people and we, we are providing a First Nations perspective, we do want it to just be our perspective. We want to be the perspective of as many community members as we could. So we got about 805 responses from First Nations communities and that's completely shaping the exhibition. So, and um, unsurprisingly to us, but I think was surprising to a lot of our um, non-Indigenous colleagues is the exhibition's going to um, very much be focused on a lot of um, post-1770, the legacies of 1770. So it's actually going to talk a lot about things like um, massacres and the stolen generations and contemporarily deaths in custody. But, but that's purely because that's what the community actually said they want in this exhibition. That's what they want to see. Um, 
So yeah. Um, so I'll I've got a little bit over time, so I'll leave it at that. But thank you. Thanks, Nathan. Um, I've uh, 